Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining the Define Tomorrow webinar today. I'm Barry Coombs and I'm joined by Megan Warren, also from Computer World. Hi everyone. Um, so I guess you're attending today because you couldn't make our event uh, over at the Celtic Manor. When was it, Megan, earlier this month, last month? 21st of June, so... Uh, wow, time, time yeah. flies by. So uh, yeah, the idea was for us to try and cram about five hours worth of content into an hour to give you guys a snippet of what we spoke about at that event. Um, and that the event was all focused on migrating at the cloud, but also simplifying your data center. And we'll come to why those two things are related um, in a moment. So I'm hoping that in the hour, we're gonna be able to cram in enough information for you to get an idea about what we've spoken about. Hopefully you're gonna find some useful tips and tricks or strategies that you can use inside your business. And we're still hoping to get a couple of live demos in uh, during the webinar during that time. So we'll see if we succeed or whether we fail and overrun. Um, the recording will be available afterwards. So if you'd like to send it to any of your colleagues, please let us know. Um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna get started. Um, looking at some of the attendees, there's certainly some of you that um, haven't um, worked with Computer World before. Um, so Computer World uh, specializes in three specific areas of technology, infrastructure modernization, workspace transformation, and security and protection, whilst delivering a vast array of services such as uh, managed services, support, training, consultancy, procurement, and recruitment. So if we can help you with any of those areas on the screen, please let me know. Um, from a sales perspective, that's probably it for now. We work with some of the biggest technology companies in the world, the likes of Dell EMC, VMware and Microsoft, but we also work with strategic other partners that help us really add value to you as our customers to deliver a full solution. The event was sponsored by those on screen and we'll be talking about some of the technologies that the vendors on screen uh, provide to help with your cloud migration as well as also simplifying your data center. So we're going to start by looking at um, something that I spoke about and John Armstrong, our managing director, spoken about uh, back at our larger event, Define Tomorrow, that happens in Bristol every, day, uh, every year around sort of November, December time. Um, and one of the things that I was talking about then and I'm still going on about is what is your strategy? I think it's increasingly important for you to have a vision as an IT manager, as an architect, that you're working towards, that you know what that vision looks like in five to 10 years time. And from there, you're able to then make a strategy that you can take bite-sized chunks to get to. And I firmly believe that if you don't have that, you're just gonna end up deploying technology for technology's sake and not really knowing where that end goal is. So I urge you all to kind of think, what is your strategy? Document your strategy, share the strategy with other people in the IT team, but also in the business get their opinion, get their buy-in. And I think something around a cloud migration is really, really important that you are including that in that vision and in that strategy. I meant to say that we've got a question and answer facility as part of this webinar. So uh, you can see at the top or the bottom of your screen, you should have the ability to send us questions. Um, Megan will be watching that during the course of this webinar. So if you have any specific questions or comments, please let me know. So first of all, I'd like you to think, what is your cloud approach? And we're seeing customers with three of them. We see some, normally very rare amount of customers that are charging ahead. They're doing everything they can to move their workloads from on-premises to the cloud. We have some customers that have really got their head in the sand a little bit. They're trying to pretend that the cloud isn't there and it isn't going to affect them and they're gonna be able to keep doing what they've been doing for a long period of time. Maybe they'll be trying to um, explain, well, the cloud's expensive, so I don't want to be doing that. Um, or others may be trying to just kind of overlook it because they've got security concerns or something like that. Whereas other customers are just saying, no, uh, we are not going to move to the cloud. And I think probably all three of those aren't quite the right approach. Um, you need to do it in a thought out strategic way, um, but certainly head in the sand and uh, certainly the head in the sand is not the right way to go. No might be right for your organization, but if the cloud isn't right for your organization today, document why it isn't. That way you're easily able to reassess that as time goes by to see if it becomes more relevant to you as you move forward. Um, a lot of people assume that moving to the cloud is something like this. They go into their VMware infrastructure, they find their virtual machine, they click copy, they sign up to AWS, 
they paste the virtual machine in AWS, and then as if it was magic, that cloud migration is then just completed. When realistically, it needs to be very, very different from that. The virtual infrastructure that you have on premises and a cloud-based infrastructure as a service, such as AWS, are very, very different. And they require different methods to be able to architect your applications to ensure they're high available and they're scalable. So at Computer World, what we really recommend that you do is you start by understanding exactly the IT services that your business is using. And don't just assume you know this because you're the IT manager or support desk manager, whatever your role is. Actually speak to the users. Ask them their opinion on what services IT deliver. Create a service catalog that you're then able to utilize to help prioritize those. You do that normally around disaster recovery, creating RTOs and uh, RPOs. But from that perspective, it can also help you prioritize what you're gonna to move to the cloud and hang. Now, as a starting point, I recommend considering is software as a service going to help us meet this requirement? For example, you've got Exchange on-premises. Why would you do anything else? You're not going to try and move that Exchange on-premises to an infrastructure as a service platform. You could do, but why not move it to Office 365? There may also be other legacy applications in your organization. And what you'll find is by doing that, not only will you be able to remove it for the on-premises infrastructure, you can also look at the other business benefits that the users may get from a cloud-based uh, solution, such as flexibility, such as mobility, such as ease of collaboration. Once you've done that, maybe look at uh, platform as a service. So certainly if you have any in-house development teams, I would highly recommend that they're looking at things like AWS or Azure to see if they could build their applications directly inside it. Or you're using a more portable model such as containers that will allow you to move that in the future if you desire to. But only then consider infrastructure as a service for things like DR or legacy workflows that really cannot go anywhere else. But it's not all about migration. We should be taking the opportunity to understand how we can transform IT. Digital transformation is one of the biggest buzzwords at the moment, and we need to have a look beyond those systems that are in place. Understand actually how your business makes profit. What is the value chain? So this is something that is often talking about in manufacturing, where what comes in and then what goes out, and how is that value added along the way? So have a look at your business, understand that, and understand if there is a pinch point that could be solved by moving something to the cloud, by re-architecting it in platform as a service. Understand those bottlenecks and understand the users, and you might be able to deliver real transformation for your business that could help it excel and grow from that perspective. Those of you um, that have read The Phoenix Project will know some of these things. Anybody that hasn't read the book, The Phoenix Project, it's kind of a, a fictional story about um, an IT manager or someone that is uh, pushed to be an IT manager in a manufacturing environment. But it's a real nice mix of fact and fiction. So I really urge you that if you haven't read The Phoenix Project, go and read that. So before you start, before you move anything to the cloud, or if you have already, take a step back. One of the things that we recommend at Computer World is creating a cloud validation framework. What this is, is a set of criteria that you have identified are acceptable for when you're gonna move something to the cloud. So a lot of people think that when you move something from on-premises to the cloud, it kind of sprinkles magic pixie dust over it and your responsibility is some way mitigated. When realistically, you've got just as much responsibility to make sure that data is safe, that data is secure. So consider how your users are going to be logging in and accessing the applications. We want to make sure that they've got a single sign-on experience. We don't want them trying to log into 10, 20 different applications with different usernames and passwords. Have a look at a technology by VMware called Workspace ONE that allows you to bring together the legacy applications, the native applications, such as those from Android and iOS, as well as software as a service applications with single sign-on on top of that. But not only that, it then allows you to manage and maintain the device and add context as to when they're allowed to access those applications. But it doesn't just benefit the user. As an IT administrator, if one of those people leave, you've got one single place where you can block all those applications. Understand data protection and resilience. Understand what the cloud provider is doing and what you will still need to be able to do. Make sure that you've done your due diligence. It's all so easy to find a fantastic piece of software these days. You've had a 30-day trial. It really meets your business uh, needs. 
but actually how much do you know about the, the company? How are they securing your data? Are they likely to still be there in two months, six months? Are they a profitable business? Try and do your due diligence to understand the business that's gonna be hosting your data. Make sure they're compliant with anything that your business needs. Understand where their data is gonna be located and if that meets the needs of your business. Uh, have a look at growth and have a look at the exit strategy. So if you want to move your data away from their application at some point in the future, far too many of these services offer lovely ways to get your data in, but not get your data out again. So create this framework, and then every time you move something to the cloud, run through this framework and make sure that the application you are looking at meets that need. Now, it's unlikely that you're going to get 100% each time, but then you're able to educate other people in the business as to what the risk is, what risk you have identified. And from that perspective, a business decision can then be made. So software as a service is going to be our starting point. With software as a service, meet your users, work with your users to understand how they're using the software, how they need to work or how they want to work and have a look at how you can enable them. A real great example is Office 365. A lot of people say, yeah, we've done a cloud migration, we've moved to Office 365, and that just means the email. They're really not seeing any greater benefit from the rest of the tools in that suite. Make sure you've got your single point for identity and authentication and refer back to that cloud framework. But the really important bit is making sure that we're delivering change, we're delivering transformation, and we're delivering something that the users actually want to be able to use. So at this point, what I would like to do is pass you over to Megan that's going to run through um, what we have done or what she has done in terms of setting up Microsoft Teams to work for a marketing department. Uh, so Megan, over to you, if you can share your screen, please. Yeah, of course. Bear with me. There we are, hopefully you can see that now. Okay, so um, this is uh, Microsoft Teams, as Barry said. Um, it's not been out that long. I think Microsoft introduced it um, just over a year ago, but they've made some real progress with it since um, it was first introduced. So um, I set up a demo um, account for the time being. Um, just to show you how a marketing team such as myself and the marketing team here at Computer World would be able to use something like Teams. So on here on the left, you have all your different types of teams. So um, under this team, you have the different channels that you can introduce. So if you had a particular um, project that you were working on within this team, you can go into here and all the conversations and all the files and everything to do with that particular project can all be stored here rather than getting um, all jumbled up in the general chat and um, functionality. So up on the top along here, you have all the different tabs. So the first one is the conversations tab, which I like to think of it almost as um, your Facebook homepage, for example. So it's just all the updates that are going on in that team, any conversations that are happening, any files that have been added, all gets updated onto here. So if you want a quick overview of what's been updated, then this is a great place to start. Um, you can also upload files. And down here, you can also start a meeting. So if I was to click that now, it would let everyone in the team that I was about to start a meeting, they could then join that. It would actually record that meeting and save it onto here. So if anyone did miss it, they could then come onto here um, and review that video of what we had that conversation about. Files is another great one to help with um, your team collaboration. So if I wanted to to edit this document, but Barry was also editing it at the same time. That's not a problem at all. We just click into here and we can both edit it at the same time in real time and Barry's changes were made at the same time as mine. Um, the great bit about it as well here is you have a conversation tab. So if I was to make a change and I wanted to make sure that Barry then didn't wonder why I'd taken that thing out and then he'd have to come find me and chase me and ask me that, I can just type my reply here explain why I've made that change, and then he's up to date at all times. And those conversations are constantly um, stored there as well. So if you ever wanted to go back and review anything um, of any changes that were made, you can see them all here as well. It also just saves that um, pain that a lot of people have had to go through if you've got five or six people editing a document, of sending that document out to everyone at the same time um, via an email, everyone making their own changes, sending it back to that one person, and then one person having to collaborate and um, sort of condense all those changes onto one document. 
Um, the meeting minutes is actually a wiki that we have called meeting minutes in here. Um, if you click here, you have the different pages and then within those pages, the different sections. So I come on here um, and within these meeting minutes, you can obviously um, see that here I've been tagged in this. So um, that would have then alert me that I've been tagged in that. And if I wanted to go and see anything on here, it would show me here that Barry's mentioned me in that. So then I know that I've been tagged and I will get an alert for that. And it just means you can keep up to date with all your um, meeting minutes. Um, as I was saying about um, being tagged and having almost like a to-do list, this ties in Microsoft Planner, um, another Microsoft uh, application. In here is just a sort of task list that you can have with your colleagues. You can come on here um, and you can assign that to, um, if I was going to assign it to myself, and then you can just keep up to date within your team of who's doing what, who's um, allocated themselves a task or someone else a task, and if anything's been done, so then you don't go and repeat that work as well. But Microsoft are actually really keen to make sure that it's not just limited to Microsoft applications. So you can integrate other applications, you can integrate web pages. So for example, we've integrated to Find Tomorrow, which I hope you obviously all know what that is now. Um, but Myself and Barry, for example, are working on the new Computer World homepage on our website. And what he's done recently is he was having a look through the website um, and he spotted something that needed to be changed here. So what he actually did was he went on here, he started a meeting with himself um, and recorded that meeting, talking about the changes that needed to be made whilst he's looking at that page. I can now go back at any time to review that video and make those changes um, rather than having to go and ask him again what he wanted me to change or what it was that he spotted, for example. Um, we've also got Twitter, but what I wanted to show you was, as I said, it's not just limited to Microsoft apps. Um, there's a huge array of different apps that you can add and these are just the start. And obviously Microsoft have only had it out a year, so I'm sure they're gonna add more to it as well, but this is just the start and it just means that your team can work incredibly collaboratively together. So if I pass back over to you, Barry. That's great. Thank you very much, Megan. So just share my screen again. So hopefully you could see there just one example of how you can um, take Office 365 and do more than just simply moving your emails from one side to another. By actually sitting down with the department, you're able to build something that is actually going to be really useful to them. All the tools that they're going to be using, all the collaboration they're going to be having, everything, the resources they need access to can be brought into that one area. Um, I've got a few polls that I'd like to run uh, during this. So could I understand from your perspective, um, are you already running Office 365? So if could you respond to the poll that's on screen now, that would be fantastic. Just give you a few more seconds to respond to that. Fantastic. So a large amount of you are already using Office 365. So maybe the next step for you is looking at things like Teams to understand how they can be used for more than just instant messaging like Skype for Business would be, but look at how it can actually be used as a collaborative platform. So if we have a look at uh, uh, the remaining thing about Office 365, and that was the point about when moving software as a service, you need to understand data protection. And with Office 365, you tend to get a functionality like a recycle bin, where as an administrator, you have a limited amount of time where you can recover certain things that are deleted. Um, and the same from a user perspective, but this really isn't a long-term data strategy. It isn't a re data redundancy strategy. So you should still be looking at ways to protect your data just like you would on-premises, but in the cloud. Barracuda spoke about their essentials offering that can be bought in a number of different ways to include things like threat protection, uh, business continuity services, but also cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup. And what they are able to do is direct from the Barracuda cloud, they are able to protect and secure uh, your Office 365 data by taking multiple backups a day, not just protecting that email data, but protecting Exchange, uh, protecting OneDrive and protecting SharePoint data as well. So from that perspective, it's really, um, it's really easy to use. It's very granular in terms of the recovery, and it's actually quite affordable as well for a service that can just bolt on. You don't need to bring that data back down into your data center and retention, you're not charged per retention, you're charged per user. So it's quite easy to uh, set up and then run from there. 
Um, the example of the dashboard is there on screen. You can see there's not a lot to it. It's very simple. You can connect OneDrive Exchange and SharePoint, set up how often you're going to be backing things up, and then do all your backups and restore through this very simple dashboard. So moving on to infrastructure as a service then. So you've done the software as a service thing, you've spoken to developers or looked at what applications or what individual components you could move to platform as a service. So how do you start considering infrastructure as a service? Um, infrastructure as a service is available from the likes of um, Island or Azure or AWS in a variety of different means, but normally taking Azure on AWS, it's not the familiar virtual infrastructure that you've got on premises. You need to build an amount of availability into the application to make sure if there is a host failure in their cloud, which can happen and is as likely to happen in your, their data center as it is yours, that you are able to architect to protect it at source. But once you've understood that, you need ways to be able to get it from left to right. So Zerto has a platform that allows you on premises to replicate from one site to a DR site. However, they've taken that a stage further now and they are seeing themselves as the central point to be able to move your data from on-premises to any cloud provider. So whether that's Azure, AWS, Island, IBM, they are able to help you move from left to right and to be able to protect that data. But equally, if you have moved your infrastructure as a service platform into Azure, you can replicate your platform to AWS. If you're on Island, you could replicate it back to on-premises. There's lots of different things that you could do and it's very customizable. So not only can this be used for a migration tool, it can then be used as a data protection tool. Now, we did mention Island there and Island are one of Zerto's biggest customers. So if you're looking for a infrastructure as a service platform that is able to give you similar facilities to that you have on premises. So maybe you want high availability. Maybe you don't want to re-architect your applications. Maybe you want to use familiar tools that you're already using on premises. Island is a full VMware cloud. They're a VMware cloud provider. They uh, are integrating with Zerto, so you can replicate from your on-premises into Island and back again if you desire, or from Island onto another one of their data centers. But they're also adding a significant amount of other tools around it, such as VMware NSX. They have an amazing dashboard that brings everything together so you can control your virtual infrastructure up at Island. So maybe this is useful to bridge that gap between the on-premises and the cloud environment if you're not able to use platform as a service or you don't want to re-architect your applications. Island are um, up there with Azure in terms of certifications. They've got the CSA star, which I think is at gold level. They've got a number of data centers around the world. Um, they have the certifications that you would come to expect and things like that. So if you're looking for a cloud partner that can be flexible, that can work with the ways you want to work, we recommend having a look at Island. Now, we've spoken a little bit about the cloud there, and the really important things is how you're going to get to the cloud, what you're going to do when you get there, how you're going to protect your data, continually kind of having a look at what your compliance and what your needs are. Now, the next thing to have a look at is compute and storage. Um, so if you want to be spending all the time re-architecting applications, connecting with users, we highly recommend that you have a look at actually what is going on in your data center. How are you going to simplify that to make sure you don't have to spend your time looking at that virtual env environment? Now, most of you will be familiar with the image at the top here, which is uh, the virtual machines running on top of your ESXi hosts connected via storage network to the SAM. And this is a very good way of running it. We've got an M plus one design here where we've got three hosts, but we have a fourth host just in case there's a failure. Um, and this has served us well. However, there's lots of moving parts here. When it comes time to upgrade, we've got to check that all these components work together. When there's a support ticket, we've got to try and identify where the problem lies in this, uh, um, uh, lies in, in this stack. We also, when we upgrade or when we need to expand, we need to consider, well, do we need more space in the SAM? Do we have to add a host? And that's where we're seeing the software defined data center take over and we're seeing real simplification. So instead of adding a separate SAN environment with a SAN switching network, we're now moving those disks back into the servers to create a hyper-converged environment with a virtual SAN being created. 
Now, the real beauty of this means is you have one platform all managed through VMware in this example that you are able to quickly and easily manage and maintain. You don't need a storage specialist. You're able to just have generalists or virtualization specialists that can take all of that on together. And there's a variety of ways of, of going and approaching that. But certainly uh, VX Rail by Dell is one of the ways that we're seeing people adopt it to drive real simplification in their data center and to take away that pain when it comes to updates. So what I wanted to try and do was do a short demo of VX Rail for you. So let me uh, move over here to uh, uh, VX Rail demo tool. And what I was actually going to show you is how we were going to upgrade a whole virtual environment uh, just in a few minutes. So clearly this is a demo tool and uh, the, um, it's been slightly, the sequence has been shortened. But what we're logging into here is something called VX Rail Manager. So what is VX Rail? You come to Computer World, come to Dell, and you are looking to refresh your infrastructure. First of all, we will have a look. We run a tool called Live Optics that allows us to analyze your environment and right size it, ready to select how many hosts and what disks are gonna go in to build that SAN infrastructure that I spoke about a minute ago. So we want to know how many hosts, how many flash disks, because vSAN is all about having a cache and then having capacity, and that can be all flash or that can be hybrid. Um, and when you buy a the maximum of four nodes that will come into your infrastructure pre-configured, ready to go, that you will be able to get up and running in about 15 minutes after stacking it. From that perspective, you just need to feed in the IP addresses, names, and things like that that you need to be able to use. Once it's in and running, you manage it like any virtual environment. It's got a vCenter, it's got vSAN, but you do have a component called the VxRail Manager, which is what we're looking at now. Now the VxRail Manager can monitor the health, you can connect directly to Dell support, you can look at events, you can look at um, all the different aspects in terms of performance. But specifically what we're looking at here is how to do an upgrade. So first of all, we're gonna come in and have a look at all the various different elements that are installed inside our environment. So we've got VMware ESXi, we've got a Dell agent, we've got vCenter, and we have a number of other uh, MIBs and the, and the VxRail Manager there. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna select a local upgrade, but equally, you could download this straight from uh, the internet. Now, the important thing is the VxRail is a stack that is end-to-end -end designed to be able to um, uh, be supported and managed by the Dell VxRail team. So from that perspective, you are not having to go and test this code yourself. It is going to have gone through a full test procedure inside of Dell before it is then available to release for the VxRail uh, users. So in this example, we're selecting the zip file and it's now just going to check that the components in your infrastructure are suitable for this upgrade that is about to go ahead. We can see that running through, that's unpacking and, and we'll have some results through in one moment. So there we go. So it can tell us what's gonna happen, what components are gonna be installed, which version of ESXi we're gonna end up on, which version of uh, the VxRail Manager, which version of the vCenter. Now if I click continue, not only is this gonna go away and upgrade the VxRail Manager, it is also going to go and upgrade your vCenter, upgrade your vSphere hosts, and all the bits in integrated with that, such as the vSAN. So there we can see that's going through, Clearly the sequence has been short, uh, shortened here. If you're on Enterprise Plus, your VMs are automatically moved between the hosts. If you're not, you will be responsible for putting each of those hosts in maintenance mode. Once that's done, your infrastructure's um, upgraded. So normally when we speak to customers, there's so many people that haven't upgraded their virtual infrastructure recently. This should really remove that to allow you to increase security and lower the amount of time you need to be spending on that virtual infrastructure. The other component of the software defined data center is virtual networking. Uh, so there is a component called uh, NSX. Now, if you can imagine, we're bringing the storage into your virtual infrastructure, but when you're looking at your traffic inside your virtual infrastructure, if we're having to go from host to host, the network traffic is having to go from one ESX host up to your physical network and firewalls and down to another host. 
Now that adds a, a lot of complication in terms of configuration and change management, but it also adds an undue burden that actually to be able to go from one network to another or to secure two networks, we have to go through a router or a firewall. So the whole premise of VMware NSX is to be able to simplify that and bring the networking down from that physical layer into your virtual environment. Now clearly you still need that physical layer, it's very important, it needs to act as that connectivity layer and it needs needed for that translation between physical and virtual. But we're able to add additional layers of security and simplify the networking inside NSX. And one of those areas is the distributed firewall. So we can introduce something called micro segmentation. What this means is if you imagine a hacker has got into your environment and he's got onto one of your servers, would he then be free to roam to any other server in your infrastructure? And without creating a hundred different firewall rules or lots of traffic or physical firewalls, it's very difficult to secure one workload from another workload in that granular fashion using physical conscripts. Now, what we do with um, VMware NSX is we're able to create rules, not just around the IP or the subnet that we're used to with firewalls, but around the name or the tag inside vSphere to create a security boundary. So if one of those applications, one of those workloads is compromised, all of a sudden they are then locked to only that workload, they can't get out. But it can also go further than that. It can integrate with further security tools such as Bitdefender antivirus. If Bitdefender detects that there is a virtual machine that has a virus on it, it is able to change those firewall rules to isolate that VM to ensure it can be sorted before put back on the network. If you use it in conjunction with a VDI environment, you're able to change the network rules and the security rules depending on who is logging into the uh, desktop. This is one of VMware's biggest growing technologies alongside vSAN, and it's the way we need to be looking at our virtual infrastructures to ensure that they're secure moving forward. There are other components in NSX as well. It can help with traffic across sites. It can help with translation in the event of a DR. There's really a lot to VMware NSX that I'd urge you to have a little bit more about. Now, we can see that there's a number of trends happening here. We're going to end up with some of our data on premises. We're going to end up with some of our data in the cloud. We're going to be using a little bit of infrastructure as a service. This is the way it's going to happen for the foreseeable future. We're going to be, and we are in, a hybrid cloud world. So we need to be looking at tools that are able to help us bridge the gap between on-premises and the cloud. And one of the areas that we spoke about at our event was around data protection. What should we do to consider data protection when we are moving into the cloud, when this, the world is changing? And again, to further simplify. So Rubrik presented, and, and the point they made is actually backup really hasn't changed in the last 20, 30 years, with minimal uh, changes being made to help improve, to offer efficiencies, or to offer uh, further security. Um, Rubrik is all about taking all of those components that are part of data protection and bringing them all into a simple appliance form factor. Each one of their appliance normally has up to four nodes in it and it has all the different components that your backup needs in that platform. So as your data grows, as you grow, all you need to be able to do is add another appliance into your infrastructure. But that's not where it changes, that's not where it finishes you're also able to bridge the different workloads. So we can see that we're removing all of those separate components, it's going into Rubrik, but we're then also able to tier our data from the Rubrik platform and archive out to the cloud. So we've got Amazon, uh, AWS, we've got Azure, we've got Google Cloud Platforms, that once your data has been written down to Rubrik, we can set up rules to make that data go somewhere else for archival, for data protection standpoints. But again, that's not just it. If you've got infrastructure as a service running in any of these different platforms, you can actually uh, deploy Rubrik directly into the cloud. So from that perspective, we're backing up our data on premises. We're backing up our data in AWS, in Azure, using one platform. And where Rubrik are taking this is they want to be the single point of truth, the single point of visibility for your data. So because their platform is appliance-based, 
they're adding more and more workloads into it and integrating with a software as a service platform to allow you to index that data, to search that data, to get analytics from that data. So even though your data is ending up being more and more dispersed, you can really control it and, and manage it um, to make sure that you've got that single point of truth. So we've gone through that quite quickly. We've shown a number of demos here. We're going to be well within our hour, which is really good. But let's remember to take this step by step. Make sure you have that vision. Make sure you have that strategy. Consider Office 365 and software as a service, but most importantly, engage with your users. Because if you're not engaging with your users, I can almost guarantee you're not going to be transforming what they're doing. You're not going to be helping them. You're not going to be helping your business. Don't forget about data protection when it comes to a software as a service and have that uh, cloud document ready that you can go around and check to make sure it's meeting your requirements. Have a look at your data center and have a look at how infrastructure as a service may help you. Is DR as a service a really good first step for that? Have you got some legacy applications that once you move into the cloud, you just want to get out of your data center? Understand if iLand could offer you an easy way of doing that with its VMware centric platform. Moving on from that then, we're looking at data protection, we're looking at hyper-converged infrastructure to simplify what is going on inside your data center before finally, how you're gonna back up those workloads wherever they are. So what is your strategy now? What can you go away and think about? What can you change that's gonna help your business with that cloud migration? Computer World can help with a number of different aspects. If you'd like to talk to us about creating that cloud validation framework, if you'd like to, us to review your existing cloud um, deployments. Um, we're also able to complete a free cloud assessment. So if you're considering moving to infrastructure as a service or DR as a service, we use a very small tool from iLine called Catalyst that will help us specify uh, and spec a uh, iLand instance for that DR or infrastructure as a service requirement. But it may also be useful to help you classify which workloads would end up in infrastructure as a service and which ones in software as a service. I've said it and I'll say it again, make sure you're working with your users. So we're gonna send an email following up to this um, asking if there's any specific ways that we can help you. Um, out of interest, I'd like to understand where people are on um, uh, their journey uh, with their virtual infrastructure. How old are the virtual infrastructures that you have in place in your businesses? So there's a poll on screen at the moment, if you could just cast your vote. Just a few more seconds for the last of you just to cast your votes. So it looks like a lot of you are in that, type, that place at the moment where you're gonna be considering what to do next. How, um, what is my next step? My virtual infrastructure is getting to that three to five year gap and you want to be able to um, understand whether you're gonna be refreshing your infrastructure or moving to the cloud. It's a good time to get that strategy in place now before it's too late. You are gonna end up hybrid. You are gonna end up with something on premises in the cloud in the majority of situations. But maybe if you're not refreshing for a year or two, you can lower the requirement and get some of those workloads from your data center and into the cloud already. So if there's any final questions, please put them in the q and I thank you for, for watching. Um, we're gonna do deeper dives on all of these subjects if that is of interest to you, so please let us know. And thank you very much for attending.